state, there are health teams concerned for the continuous improvement of quality, compassionate care delivery to the patients, clients and their families and carers within our health service. Together, they are facilitating essentials of care and this program is dedicated to their experiences. I am Ruth Smoother and this is EOC tonight. Welcome. Tonight we are going to explore the progression of essentials of care through the South Eastern Sydney Local Health District and specifically the evaluation of facilitation development, its barriers and enablers. Joining me tonight is my co-coordinator for the district, Tamara Watling. <laughs> Tamara, thank you for being here tonight. You've done some exciting research over the last 12 months. Would you introduce what our team has been doing in Cecilid and take us through that evaluation? Sure, thanks Ruth. District implementation of Essentials of Care is facilitated by the Essentials of Care coordinator team within the Cecilid Nursing and Midwifery Practice and Workforce Unit. The purpose of this unit is to facilitate the development of an effective and patient-centred workforce. EOC aligns with this purpose through providing a framework for the evaluation of patient care and workplace culture, enabling staff to collaborate to create an environment where patient care quality and safety is prioritised. Our role involves working with staff at all levels of the organisation for the strategic planning of EOC implementation and integrating the framework with priorities around patient care quality, consumer engagement and development of staff. Cecilet has been engaged with Essentials of Care since 2008 following its development at the, the LHD's pilot site, the Prince of Wales Hospital. EOC has been implemented in eight hospitals and including the community specialties of mental health, child and family health and women's health. There is variable engagement across the sites and services ranging from 30% to 100%. Strategic planning for 2013 involved taking a look at the progress of EOC across the district and noting trends related to the progression through the phases to facilitated development and to governance. We noted that 40% of teams were in the preparation phase and many of these teams had spent up to 12 months in this phase. Retention of facilitators since 2008 was approximately 50%. So we identified the need to collect some data around these items and decided to evaluate the existing strategies for facilitated development. Well, we know from the literature on the analysis of practice development, quality improvement and research projects that skilled facilitation significantly contributes to their success. The Promoting Action on Research Implementation in Health Services Framework provides a conceptual map of the factors that play a role in the successful implementation of research into practice. This framework identifies facilitation as an interdependent factor, working with evidence and context. Knowing that skilled facilitation contributes to the conditions required to effectively progress EOC, our team decided to evaluate the existing approaches to developing facilitators. The CESLET Facilitator Development Program provides an opportunity for staff to develop the skill set required to effectively facilitate the progression of EOC. We wanted to know from facilitators what the barriers and enablers are to a development and application of facilitation skill as well as the critical supports that build resilience to work with the evidence and contextual factors for the implementation and progression of EOC. We took three key approaches to this evaluation. The first included promoting full participation of facilitators in the facilitator development program and looking at the impact that this had for team progression through EOC, the EOC phases. The second involved the creation of a survey monkey to obtain participant feedback in a number of key areas. The third involved evaluating key learning and evolving workshop session content based on participant feedback and coordinated team reflection. The results of the first method of promoting full participation in the facilitated development program resulted in an increase in the retention of facilitators recruited since 2008 from 50% to 70%. A reduction of the teams in preparation phase from 40% to 30% and this number accounts for all new teams recruited and 30% of teams had progressed beyond cycle one. The second method involved the creation of a survey monkey, which allowed us to capture feedback on many aspects of facilitator development, progression of EOC and the support needs of facilitators. This slide shows the specific sports support needs identified from the survey monkey. The top four were co-facilitation with an experienced facilitator, observing an experienced facilitator, participation in facilitator support groups and receiving coaching. 
We also asked about the frequency of use of the key practice development tools and theories introduced to facilitators in the workshops. Those most frequently used in practice were the ways of working, practice development principles, the claims, concerns and issues tool, and the circle of influence and circle of concern. The key barriers and enablers to the development of facilitator skill, knowledge and confidence were around the opportunities for supported practice, time and prioritisation, as well as leadership support. In our experience, these are the barriers and enablers that we expected to see, and they are supported by literature on facilitation development and the challenges of applying learning into practice, as well as the support required to do this in a sustainable way. The advantage of this evaluation is that the data is specific for our LHD and relates directly to the strategic direction of our workforce development for CESLET. Mm. Thanks for sharing that, Tamara. It looks like there's some pretty clear enablers and barriers for, from facilitators in terms of progressing through essentials of care. So we invited a few other guests from across our district to be with us tonight and give us their perspective on these barriers and enablers. Welcome Mary and Susie from Prince of Wales Hospital where it all began. Thanks Ruth. Thank you Ruth. We are proud of our EOC heritage at the Prince of Wales Hospital. Susie and I are very happy to share with you briefly some of how, of how we have worked with some of the enablers and barriers that Tamara has found in the study. As you can see from the slide, there's a picture there of a sheep standing on a rock. And we use that as a metaphor for what it was like for the facilitators, the early facilitators, because they were standing on unknown territory and they didn't know whether the rock was going to collapse underneath them or whether it was going to support them. They were clinical nurses acting as practice developers. Over the years, we've carried out research and evaluation. And what we have found in relation to the key enablers for, uh, for facilitator development are three key things. Firstly, facilitation is not a journey you do on your own. It is really important to be part of a strong leadership team. And that leadership team needs to have a very good understanding of practice development principles. That team then needs to be supported organizationally. At the Prince of Wales, we have a dynamic EOC steering committee that provides that support. Secondly, the value of co-facilitation. We're very fortunate at our hospital to have a team of external facilitators who work with internal facilitators. And that not only allows for effective role modeling, but it, it also allows for the internal facilitator to have a voice in EOC work and processes. And finally, we recognize, especially for early facilitators, how, how, how challenging and how, how difficult it can be to capture EOC processes and outcomes. So we try our best to try and offer as much support and guidance in order to um, help facilitators in that way. And uh, Susie will um, expand a bit more on that. Thanks, Mary. It sounds like so support through all layers of the organisation is important, plus that having an experienced role model to work with. Susie, what else can you add to this? Um, thanks, Ruth. And I think, as, as Mary just mentioned, we provide the support and guidance with evaluation um, of essential care and its reporting. And, and this isn't always easy. As we all know, you know, this has mainly come about with multiple factors that have driven the, um, the transformations in practice and the quality improvement over the last few years. And we're all given these wonderful gifts, these national and state initiatives to work with. Um, we have national standards accreditation requirements and of course real you know um, advances in technology to work with and this has really resulted in a complicated and increased quality and practice change environment and as Tamara shared there's the challenges of workload and clinical priorities also so our leadership teams um, we have sometimes struggled to determine where what sits where is it safety and quality? Is it essentials of care? Is it practice development? Is there a linkage to national standards? Mm -hmm. There's been so much duplication, and at times po things have po possibly been missed. Um, and the slide, this slide um, is the first draft of a Prince of Wales conceptual framework that we've developed to support and enable the leadership teams and facilitators to see and consider where it all links. It's everyday business, it's with the practice development principles underpinning and framing how it works at Prince of Wales. 
And this next slide is a bird's eye view of an evaluation reporting template. We call it SENSE. You might be able to see the SENSE at the top. And we've developed this in collaboratively um, to support the leadership teams to document contemporaneously the practi transformational practice development that they're undertaking, the linkage and evidence of their outcomes. Good, thanks. So a lot of work's gone into that and thank you for sharing it with us tonight. Prince of Wales have had some exciting clinical outcomes they'd like to share. Nine West in particular have developed a few slides for us. Cassie, would you take us through some of your outcomes? Yes, of course, Ruth, and I'd like to say thanks for inviting me on the show tonight. Um, this first slide uh, shows the themes our team have developed over three cycles of essentials of care. Over time, our emphasis has changed from nailing the basics of patient care to unit-specific projects. We use a variety of tools to develop the themes, from internal and external audits such as hand hygiene, safety audits, periods of observation, and most importantly, staff engagement. As a facilitator, I love to see and share results. The next slide will demonstrate how much can be achieved through well-supported and facilitated EOC projects. Um, a, a couple of our successes include uh, the improved completion of risk assessments such as pressure injury and falls risk. As you can see, we moved from non-existent uh, in 2008 to a fantastic 100% completion by 2012. Wow. Now, whilst hand hygiene has come along a long way, it's now almost a competition to be the best team in town on our ward. In 2012, we moved away from observation and uh, instead we asked the team to identify project ideas from their day-to-day -day work. And this led to the more unit-specific themes. We were thrilled by the huge reduction in time to culture, diagnose and treat peritonitis with a significant impact on the quality of care and the length of stay. All the important numbers. As a facilitator and as an educator, I'm proud of the introduction of our active learning books. These are simple exercise books, but they enable the staff to document and reflect their learning whenever they wish on the ward. This came from a staff-identified need to provide evidence of their ongoing CPD at re-registration. The next three slides show examples of the growth and improvement made over the three cycles of EOC so far. Whilst Tamara displays these, I'll share some of the methods of facilitation we've utilised. We hold monthly clinical practice meetings. The EOC meetings are held on different days of the week to enable a wider cohort of our staff to be involved. We use Gibbs' reflective tool, claims, concerns and issues, and then facilitate smaller groups to develop the action plans. I've enjoyed my transition from novice participant to a skilled EOC facilitator, which has been made easier by the facilitator development workshops, having an experienced co-facilitator in my unit, and the strong EOC support network at Prince of Wales. I think that work speaks for itself. It's so exciting, isn't it, to see actual clinical incomes that, outcomes rather, that impact positively for our patients. Moving us on to some of our guests from Sydney Sydney Eye Hospital now. Welcome Lynette, Alex and Angela. Thanks for being with us tonight. I'd like to start with Lynette. Lynette, how do you see um, Tamara's study working in with what your experience is at Sydney Sydney Eye Hospital? It absolutely does, Ruth. Um, facilitators were really struggling in the early days. They were feeling quite isolated in their work. Then we introduced the facilitator support group, which met with two of the key enablers of Tamara's study. One was the opportunity to actually observe a more experienced facilitator at work, and the second being just absolutely feeling the benefits of participating in the facilitator support group itself. Our facilitators started to feel far more connected with the work that they were doing and with each other. Um, and well, well, why don't we ask one of them? We've got Alex and Angela, who are two of our facilitators from Sydney Sydney Eye Hospital, and they've been attending the group since the very beginning. Oh, great idea, Lynette. Alex, how have you found the facilitator support group? Well, I find um, facilitating essentials of care is like learning a new language. Of course, I would like to wake up tomorrow morning speaking Mandarin. But I recognise there are many steps along the way. The support group helped me with those steps. When the group first started, I was actually ready to give up my role as facilitator. I felt really burned out. The support group helped me to get ready with, with the project and was great support. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Alex. Um, and Angela. Angela is one of our facilitators from the theatres in, um, in Sydney, Sydney Eye Hospital. And you've come up with quite a unique way of meeting that barrier of getting time to meet, didn't you? 
Yes, I think it is quite unique. Uh, we have challenges being able to hold team essentials of care meetings in the unit, but from the beginning we've had great management support. So once a month on the low activity day, one facilitator and four staff meet for a six hour ADO workshop where we progress through the essentials of care work. Uh, we then feed this back to the rest of the staff in a half hour in service the week following the workshop. And this works well for us. Excellent. Thanks, Angela. And I think you also said that managerial support throughout all of that was really key to you. And we invited one of our managers um, from the district. Welcome, um, Liz, from the um, Narang Barai Child and Family Health Team. How do you address the barrier of getting time to meet and work together? Um, hi, Ruth. Yes, um, it is definitely a challenge at times to um, work with our essentials of care work and try and work that into our workload, um, especially with other competing priorities. Um, but we always um, build essential of, of care um, processes into our team meetings and discussions and we just make sure that it's a priority. Um, and I always try to role model the fact that it is very, very important that we do this. Um, I encourage um, and support the facilitators to take um, the lead on essentials of care discussions and make sure that it's a team-led um, project um, at all times. Um, and um, we've just found that the value that the Essentials of Care um, project work adds to our um, workplace culture and our work um, far outweighs um, any struggles that we have to allocate time to it. Thank you, Liz. And thank you to all of our guests for your contributions to our program tonight. It seems as though South Eastern Sydney Local Health District has worked well on evaluating the impacts of facilitation development on progressing essentials of care in the district and have come up with some creative ways to increase enablers and work against the barriers. I'd like to invite Tamara now to wrap up our program tonight with a look ahead to the future. Thanks, Ruth. For 2014, sharing our evaluation results with stakeholders at the executive levels has provided a foundation for the following strategies. To promote full participation in the facilitator development program through a revised recruitment process which involves having study leave approved in advance for all workshops. An internal essentials of care coordinator at all sites has been identified to strengthen governance and local accountability and to manage reporting. As coordinators, we are working with the internal EOC coordinator to assess the skill sets at each site around the critical support needs identified in the Survey Monkey, and to develop local support models that link EOC facilitators in with skilled colleagues in providing the identified critical support needs. This slide shows one example of a local support model. The purpose of this model is to create site-based communities of practice for supporting the development of essentials of care facilitators, as well as for enabling staff within an organisation to apply an existing skill set. In this case, the existing skill set is coaching. Preparation for implementation would involve recruitment on a voluntary basis of skilled staff and EOC facilitators. Introductory workshops on the theory, practical and ethical components of the model would be held, and external facilitation of the setup of each community of practice would happen. This model lends itself to the opportunity for district communities of practice if adopted by multiple sites. The intent behind these strategies is to build and sustain the investment into staff development as well as practice development approaches to change management, to build the facilitation ca capability of staff, to embed enabling into core business, to maximise the translation of learning into practice, and finally, to enable the facilitators of CESLET to work with their colleagues to create the conditions for human flourishing for our staff and for the patients and for the families that we serve.